Alrighty. Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to another webinar today during our virtual alumni week. Uh, my name is Andrew Kalman. I work in college advancement at Dickinson, and I just want to say thank you all for participating today and for being here. Um, this has been a really exciting week for us. Definitely different than what we're used to, but still really exciting. So thank you for joining us. Um, today's um, webinar is Tips for a Sustainable Home or Office. Um, it is being led by Ken Schultes, class of 89. Um, Ken is our Associate VP for Sustainability and Facilities Management, or Facilities Planning, excuse me, at Dickinson. Um, and he's gonna lead this one today. So I'm gonna, before, um, before anything else, I do wanna say too, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to save them to the end and you can unmute yourself then once we have, uh, or once Ken is all finished up and um, he'll be happy to do a quick Q&A. But without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ken. Okay. Hey, thanks very much. Thanks for uh, tuning in to this, uh, to this Zoom meeting um, about making your home and office more sustainable. I, ha I have to admit, I've never done this presentation before. Uh, and although I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings, I, I actually haven't really done a screen share before. So I'm hoping it, uh, I'm hoping it goes well. My highest goal is that uh, hopefully you get a few uh, good takeaways from this that you can use in your own home or office and that it's, uh, and that it's, it's meant to be sort of a, a fun thing as well. So this is my class. This is the class of 89. That's when I graduated from Dickinson. Um, I'm right there in case you're wondering who I am and uh, with my class behind me. And uh, as Andrew said, I'm the Associate Vice President for Sustainability and Facilities Planning. And I've been here at the college, working at the college really since 1995, uh, most of that time in facilities management. So I've got a really good uh, background in, in facilities and uh, energy and energy management and things like that. Um, I also have a radio show on campus. So whenever I do any kind of presentation, I like to uh, call it out because I'm trying to up my listenership from like five to maybe 10 or something. <laughs> it's the Sustainability Jam Hour and it's on uh, WDCV, on WDCV, which is the college radio station. So tune into that if you can. It's Mondays at 10 o'clock. Uh, I play music and then try to make connections to uh, sustainability. And it's definitely just meant to be fun, a little bit informative, so. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. Uh, my agenda, the agenda for today is uh, I want to do a really quick, I'm going to call it a lightning update on some things that Dickinson's doing right now in sustainability. Uh, I want to do this quickly. I know that might not be why you tuned in, but since it is Dickinson's alumni weekend, I thought that we should spend at least five minutes maybe just going over some recent things that have uh, happened here at the college. There's some really exciting stuff going on in the area of sustainability. Then I want to do a really quick uh, couple of slides on why I think this is important, but I'm sort of uh, envisioning that if you're here tuning into the webinar that you already think it's important. So I'm certainly not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, and I just want to uh, get to the top 10 tips uh, pretty quickly here and spend a little bit more time on those. Uh, so I like this slide. I was traveling a few years ago in upper state New York and I saw this on the side of the road, so I pulled over and took a picture of it. I would just say, if you have a house that looks like this, then you don't need to be at this webinar right now. <laughs> like, you're already sustainable, right? So uh, this is an actual house that was on the side of the road. Uh, giant solar panel on top. Interesting, too, because it's more than just the energy piece that they're obviously uh, focused on in this house. It's a small house. I think that's sort of sustainable, right? But also the yard isn't perfect. It's not like this lush lawn. And, uh, you know, they're just sort of maybe not fertilizing, maybe not watering too much. And that's actually really sustainable. So uh, I'll have a, uh, a few thoughts on that later in the, in the uh, meeting here as well. Okay, so I want to do this lightning up, up update on things that are going on. It's going to be really quick if something I uh, show you a picture of uh, makes you want to talk about it more. We can, uh, as Andrew said, do that at the end. Uh, first of all, this is our first year of carbon neutrality here at Dickinson College. So uh, so this has been a long time coming. We've made this commitment to be carbon neutral about 13 years ago, and we slated 2020 to be our first get in there, and, and uh, we're doing it. So 2020 for us ends at the end of June. So, um, so it's really exciting. We're one of the top 10 colleges in the country to, to hit this uh, goal, to achieve this goal, which is really exciting. And we're we're tied with Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. Uh, they also announced this year that they're carbon neutral. 
This is our solar uh, field on campus. It came online uh, a little over a year ago. It's um, a really, it's a three megawatt solar field. It produces about 25 uh, percent of the electricity uh, consumed at the college. And uh, so it's a really exciting thing that's happening here on campus. If you're familiar with Dickinson Park, this is just a quick map. Um, the, uh, if you know where the uh, baseball, the varsity baseball field is up there and the soccer fields and softball fields are up there. Uh, this is just to the west of that. And um, it's really kind of a beautiful uh, array, I think. I mean, I'm into this stuff, but so I would, uh, so I, I think solar panels are, are sort of aesthetically appealing. But uh, oh, let me just say that uh, web uh, site up in the corner of the screen here, uh, Dickinson.edu/slash carbon neutral. If you want more information on our carbon neutrality uh, uh, goal and, and how we achieved it, you can go there. There's a lot of good information there. Um, I wanted to show this because uh, while we did uh, take some, uh, some of a cornfield offline, we did uh, think it was important to, to maintain uh, crop area all around the solar fields. And so these pictures kind of show that. And then this is a recreational trail on our Dickinson property that goes all around the solar fields and around Dickinson Park. It's, uh, it's a 5K trail, so the cross country team utilizes this now for their practices and, and meets. And it's just a beautiful area and hopefully these uh, pictures show that. This is Matt Steinman, he's the uh, assistant farm. Uh, director, uh, so we are um, taking care of the ground underneath the panels with sheep, which is a really sustainable way to do that. If we didn't do it with sheep, we'd have to be mowing that, and mowing uh, obviously uh, emits carbon and isn't the most sustainable way to take care of uh, a plot of land. So we're doing this with our sheep, and actually we found that it's um, it's been really successful so far and uh, the sheep seem to like it. <laughs> it's not causing any neighbor problems. We literally haven't, last year we had an 80, 80 sheep in our herd at the college farm and all 80 of them came up here and we're eating grass underneath the solar field. So it's all sort of exciting. So they're our mowing team. They're the solar mowing team and this picture uh, uh, shows that. So uh, this solar field isn't our only solar on campus. We actually have about 10 other solar arrays on campus. This shows the solar trellis behind Althaus and Old West. Um, Kaufman Hall, which is the building that houses most of the college's sustainability programs, uh, has quite a few solar arrays associated with it. This picture shows some of those on the roof. And uh, this is some solar arrays. You can just barely kind of see it there above the brick building. And also there's a ground mount solar uh, array in that parking lot. And so uh, I just wanted to, to, to give a sense of the fact that we're, we're pretty into solar and it's been a big part of our climate action plan and getting the carbon neutral. Uh, this year we were able to install three um, EV char charging stations and uh, we're really excited about that. I mean, basically, um, you know, you have to have these charging stations um, in order for people, I think, to be willing to, to buy an electric car because they need a place to charge it. And so sort of a chicken and egg uh, situation between do you buy, you know, do people buy cars first or do the stations go up first? And at any rate, we have had people certainly over time wanting these stations on campus and we were able to install these with a grant actually. So 75% uh, of the cost of these was paid for by the uh, P-A-D-E-P. So, um, so that's, um, we're happy about that as well. Um, we have a LEED Platinum Residence Hall on campus now. This is our new residence hall on High Street. And uh, it's one of the only LEED Platinum Residence Halls in the country. And um, so we were really excited to get that certification. Uh, I will say that's our seventh LEED building on campus, LEED certified building. All the other six are LEED Gold and this one's LEED Platinum, which is the highest level. Um, stormwater is an important aspect of being sustainable and how you manage stormwater to protect uh, local waterways and watersheds. And so we had to have a few areas on campus that have been challenging. If any of you lived in the quads, uh, you might remember the quads flooding and big rain events. And so we actually worked with the borough and uh, the borough received a grant and helped us put in this uh, um, curbside uh, water basin, um, which is a very sustainable way to handle uh, the storm water out there. And it's worked. Uh, the other night there was a huge rainstorm and I happened to be at Messino's getting uh, dinner and I uh, decided to run over and make sure the quads weren't flooding and they weren't. So uh, we were really happy about that. The farm is one of 
are real pillars of sustainability on campus. I sort of think of it that way. And um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the farm because I could talk forever about the farm. It's just an amazing sustainable place. And this picture shows that things are alive and well at the college farm in case you're wondering. Um, and uh, the tree house is another one of those pillars in my opinion. You know, this has been a uh, residence hall on campus where students have chosen to live here to, to, to exhibit sustainable behaviors really. Since 1990, they moved here uh, in 2005, I think. The tree house is alive and well as well. And the Center for Sustainability Education, I consider to be one of the key reasons that we've been so successful on campus in terms of uh, the initiatives and successes we've had. Uh, in sustainability, both academically, and they do a lot operationally and certain to, certainly to connect the two. Um, and so SEAS uh, is just an amazing uh, resource that we have on campus. And then uh, in case you're just thinking, well, that's the world according to Ken, but does anybody else think you're sustainable? We've received a lot of uh, sustainability accolades and awards and certifications, and this slide uh, uh, gives you a sense of some of those. So that's the lightning round on what's been happening at Dickinson. And again, I just thought it would be uh, kind of uh, good to start with that since, uh, since, since this is our alumni uh, weekend event. Um, and so now I'm gonna do a quick couple of slides on why um, I think it's important uh, to be sustainable. So obviously Dickinson feels like it's important and hopefully those slides uh, provide a great indication of that. But, um, but you're tuning in because hopefully you want your house and or office or something in your community to be more sustainable. And so you must think it's important too. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but let me just go over this. Um, you know, when I was doing, creating this PowerPoint, I came across this slide and I thought it was uh, kind of good. I was searching on something and this popped up. Um, I like this, the earth laughs in flowers. So if the earth laughs in flowers, we definitely have to take care of the earth, right? So we need to be sustainable. We need to, uh, to change our behaviors and uh, the way we do things in order to uh, allow the earth to sustain uh, future generations. And so I really liked that quote. And then I think that these are images to show why it's important that we really immediately start really focusing on sustainability because these are images of when the earth isn't laughing, I think, um, showing flooding and forest fires and drought and sea level rising and glaciers melting and all the things that we know are happening uh, because of climate change and because of the carbon emissions that we are emitting into the atmosphere. And so these, are, these images hopefully provide a good sense of why this is important. I don't think the earth laughs when it has garbage dumped all over it either. So I thought I'd send these pictures uh, another indication of why it's so important to be, to be sustainable uh, as well. Uh, here's an image of smokestacks from a, a power generation plant. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like this picture because it's so disgusting. And I hope that when people look at it, they're like, oh my God, I got to start doing something. And, um, and so that's kind of why I'm showing it. But the electricity uh, that we get off the grid, obviously, is responsible for a huge portion of the uh, emissions uh, that we have in our carbon footprints. And so it's important to start uh, changing changing those systems to more sustainable generation systems. But also the uh, carbon emissions and just plain old pollution that comes out of our tailpipes of our cars and out of airplanes. Uh, I think this image, hopefully, when you look at it, is like, oh my God, this is horrible. We, get, we can't, this doesn't make any sense and we need to start making changes. Uh, and again, the, the smoke that comes out of the chimneys in our houses from, from our furnaces or our hot water heaters is obviously partially responsible for uh, this climate change issue. So those are some issues on why. Hopefully you just look at those and, and it's motivating, like, wow, we, we can do better than that. Uh, we had a um, Rose Walters Prize winner on campus several years ago, Elizabeth Colbert, and she, she did uh, a few lectures and, and they were really, really terrific. And uh, one of the things she said was, if aliens were observing human activity on Earth, they might think that our primary goal as a society is to extract carbon from the ground and send it up into the atmosphere. I thought that was a great quote. And I think it's, it's kind of motivating when you think of it. If you really just step back and look at the way we live, that, that easily could be a way that people perceive us. And whether you believe in aliens or not, hopefully it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thought that, that might be motivational. And of course, the other reason we need to do this is it's not just for the environment. I like this slide because it, you know, it's people, planet, and profit, or you, know, you might hear 
uh, the term ESG, um, um, the social governance and environmental reasons to do this, but it's not just about the environment, it's about social justice, and it's about saving money too, because uh, this consumption, this ridiculous consumption of fossil fuels is not the most efficient way to be um, doing things, and we can save money if uh, we uh, implement these sustainability initiatives as well. And this slide just sort of uh, shows that in sort of a different way. So I do think, you know, one big reason for doing this, that why is because future generations, our kids, their kids, uh, you know, we want the planet to be able to sustain them at least as much as, uh, and as well as it has sustained us. And so that's a great reason to change. And I talked about money. Health is a big reason too. You know, when you see that smoke coming out of smokestacks and airplanes, uh, that, that could be a way that you can help motivate other people who may, might not believe in climate change or might not believe that they can make a difference. Because even if you don't somehow believe that carbon emissions are creating uh, this problem, that's pollution, right? That's, nobody can deny that that's pollution coming out of those smokestacks. And so there's great health reasons to make these changes as well. And I like to think too that lower left um, image of uh, that's meant to be sort of wildlife. And, you know, it's not just people, you know, we're kind of ruining the planet for, um, for all the inhabitants of the planet, you know, all the um, organisms and animals and plants here. So, I mean, that is another reason that we need to make a difference. I mean, that we need to make changes. Um, I like this quote, you know, here's what I know about the future. It happens as a result of what we're doing today. Um, and so uh, hopefully that, that really kind of is, a, is a, a great, uh, a great quote, hopefully a motivational quote. Okay, that's my slides on why. Uh, clearly could talk all day about why, um, but I wanted to uh, pretty quickly go through those two things and then get to this top 10 list. I don't know if you'll think any of these are uh, incredibly um, innovative or anything, but, um, but hopefully you do. I'm hoping that there's at least a few ideas that you can pull away from this, uh, from these, uh, this top 10 list that you can use at your own at your own home or office. So let's get into it. Um, the first one is to know and reduce your carbon footprint. So that's the first thing. I mean, if you don't know what you're emitting or how much you're consuming, and it could be even water that you're consuming or, uh, or energy that you're consuming, if you don't know how much you're consuming, then it's hard to kind of do anything about it. So I think the first step is to know uh, your carbon footprint and then to reduce it. So, uh, excuse me, reduce it. So uh, I have a few slides. You might be like, yeah, that's great, but how do I do that? And it's actually not that difficult to do a quick uh, carbon inventory and sort of to figure out your emissions, maybe your annual emissions for your house or your family or yourself. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into uh, carbon emissions. There's a lot of sources of carbon emissions out there, but the big four I would... Uh, put forth to you are electricity consumption, uh, the consumption uh, related to heating spaces, and that's typically the consumption of natural gas or oil to heat spaces or hot water. Uh, driving, you know, driving is a huge um, um, percentage of your carbon emissions, most likely if you do drive. And then travel uh, and basically air, air travel is, is the fourth. And so if you were able to, to figure out your emissions from those four, that should, for most people, represent probably 95% of your, your footprint other than uh, some sort of upstream and downstream uh, emissions uh, related to your purchases of food, for instance. So um, food's a big, a big one, but a little harder to get your arms around. So I would maintain that if you can concentrate on these, uh, that would be a great way and a great start in sort of knowing what your footprint is. Um, and so real quick, how, and you know, you're going to get this, I, I guess we're going to post this presentation afterwards, so you don't have to take notes if you don't want to here. Uh, but when you're looking at those four areas, this is sort of the, um, the uh, information and the data that you need in order to, uh, to figure out your footprint associated with those things. Um, so, you know, you can take your electricity bill and see how many kWh kilowatt hours you consume. Multiply it basically by a pound, and that'll give you how many pounds of, elect of uh, carbon you are emitting as a result of your grid-tied electricity. Now, that changes depending on where you live and the sources that are actually 
uh, in, you know, that are actually going into your local grid or your regional grid. But as a general rule of thumb, you know, for the college here in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, it's a little less than a pound per kWh, and it makes the math really easy. So, um, so, uh, so if you do that, you can you can get to your pounds associated with electricity, and then you can see those other sort of um, the other arithmetic there for the other areas. But it really isn't that bad. So if you took your your gas bill from your gas company, it, your prob your consumption is probably on that bill in CCF, which is uh, 100 cubic feet, it might be in there as MCF, so you might have to do a little conversion there. But you would just take your CCF that's from your utility bill and multiply it by 12, and that gives you the pounds of carbon related to your consumption of natural gas, for instance. So this isn't really all that challenging to do. Um, gasoline, um, when you burn gasoline, um, and you know, this is what we're talking about here is burning fossil fuels, right? So when you burn gasoline in your car, um, you're emitting 20 pounds per gallon. Doesn't matter uh, about what you're, uh, in that sense, I mean, that's just sort of like a, a law of physics or something, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you have a, a 40 mile per gallon car, a 20 mile per gallon car, you burn a gallon of gasoline in that car, it's 20 pounds per gallon. Now you do need to know your fuel efficiency in order to calculate your, your emissions. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, in the next slide. And then when you uh, take an airplane, just so you know, um, the, the uh, Calculation there is you're emitting 0.4 pounds of carbon of carbon per air mile. So if you can figure out how many miles you're traveling, uh, multiply it by 0.4, and that gives you your pounds uh, for going in a plane. And um, a quick tip: if you don't know how many gallons of gas you purchase a year, like I wouldn't know that. That would be really hard to figure out. Uh, it's a little easier to figure out the miles that you drive per year. Uh, so if you just take your mileage and divide it by your miles per gallon, that'll give you your gallons. And then you can just use that 20 pound uh, multiplier for that. So um, real quick, um, that's how you get to pounds of carbon, but typically carbon's measured in metric tons. Um, so a metric ton of carbon is, is a way that people compare their carbon emissions to other people or organizations compared to one another. Usually it's not in pounds because there's just, there's a lot of pounds. Uh, so you, you go to metric ton. So a metric ton of carbon uh, is 2,200 uh, pounds of carbon. So 2,200 pounds of carbon in a metric ton. And so you'll see on the next slide, that's sort of a way to compare against um, yourself against others. The E there is just so it's and that's sort of the nomenclature for it, metric tons of carbon emissions and the E is for equivalent. So there's other greenhouse gases that are going into the uh, equation here but they all can be uh, boiled down to, to carbon emissions or carbon emission equivalent. So just as a quick example um, for how you can figure out your uh, footprint um, so I, I put this together and on the right there is an electric bill. That's a PPL electric bill. And on your electric bill, if you just look at it, usually there's a little chart there. It'll show you your uh, KWH that you've consumed. And so for electricity, again, it's really easy. Um, you multiply it by a pound per KWH, divide it by 2200, and that'll tell you how many metric tons you have. And so uh, in this example, if you did that math and you have 10,000, KWH, that would be 10,000 pounds and it would be 4.5 metric tons. And so I don't want to bore people by going over all of this, but that, that gives you an example of, of kind of what you do. And if you're just looking at those four areas we talked about, this actually isn't all that involved. Um, it's actually not that hard to do. Um, so um, in this particular example, it's adding up to 15 metric tons of carbon. Um, per year. And then this slide, you know, this is from 2010, which I actually didn't realize that until, until not too long ago. So I should have gotten an updated slide here. Um, unfortunately, it might not be all that different, but um, I think it is important. So, so this slide does, it gives you a sense of uh, how you compare. So um, the, the average person in the world, um, you know, the carbon emissions per capita worldwide is 4.5 metric tons of carbon per person per year. Now, sadly, in the U.S., that's, it's above 17 metric tons. And so um, that gives you a sense of just, you know, how much of a problem the U.S. is, uh, is generating uh, in relation to other countries. So you can kind of see this. And again, these numbers have clearly changed in the last 10 years, but, um, but we definitely are 
kind of off the charts in terms of this. And so it could be that um, it, it's important, I think, uh, and, and this is sort of a tip too, to, to make a goal for yourself, right? Like the college made this goal to be carbon neutral um, almost, you know, over 10 years ago. And we set the way we would do that and we set the year that we would do that. And that helped us get there. I, I fully believe that we would not have reached our goal by 2020 if we hadn't set that as a commitment uh, over 10 years ago. And so perhaps uh, for yourself, if you're trying to have a sustainable home or office, uh, set a goal, set a carbon emission goal. Once you figure out what your carbon emissions are, you can maybe make your goal the world average. Uh, or maybe it's just to cut your carbon emissions in half by a certain amount of time. But I would just suggest that that might be a good way to make sure you get there. Um, okay, so that was the first uh, the first tip um, to be more sustainable is to know your carbon footprint and then to set goals for, for reducing your carbon footprint. And um, so my second uh, tip in the top 10 is uh, to focus on lighting. So lighting is responsible for a really big percentage of your carbon emissions, almost everybody's. Whether you're an organization or a person, you know, it's, it's just, it represents a big percentage. Uh, lighting is typically about 30% of your, uh, the consumption of electricity that you have um, is related to lighting. So a third of your electricity consumption is, uh, is for lights. And um, that's a lot. So basically it boils down to probably on the average, and this changes for people obviously, but that 10% of your footprint is from lighting. So it's, it's a huge percentage of your footprint for just lights, right? And lights are important, but there are some really easy, inexpensive ways to reduce your consumption of energy associated with lights. Um, so one is LED lights. So hopefully you're already sort of bought onto the LED train. And if you haven't, I highly suggest you do. I mean, LED lights are way more efficient than any other source of lighting out there. And they've come way down in price and they last way longer than any, any other light. Uh, bulb uh, out there. And so really LED is sort of a no-brainer right now in terms of uh, achieving uh, a, a more sustainable house or um, office. And I will say um, some people are like, wow, I don't like the, the color of a, you know, the hue of the, of the LED light. But really you can get an LED light at this point in almost any colorway. Uh, it can be cool. It can be warm. And Basically, they make an LED light bulb to replace almost any other uh, bulb. So it's a, you don't have to replace the whole fixture. At this point, they have bulbs that fit into the fixtures that are out there for the most part. And uh, so it doesn't have to be a, a, a really expensive venture to, to take a big bite out of your emissions related to lights. And then some other uh, examples of things you can do is dimmers. So if you have lights that dim, when you dim a light, it's using less energy. Producing less light is using less energy, so that's a way to cut your emissions. Motion sensors obviously are great. If you forget to turn off your lights, they'll do it for you. Uh, daylight controls are good. That's um, like dusk to dawn, so a lot of people have a daylight control on their outside lights so that they go off during the day and they only come on at, at nighttime. But you can do that inside too if you happen to have a room that gets a ton of natural light. You could put a daylight control on that. And, uh, and that'll make sure that the lights go off when there's enough light coming in the windows. Uh, do it in the dark events is something we do at the college. There's no reason you can't do that at home. So it could be a fun thing. Maybe if you have kids, maybe just sponsor a night where you're like, hey, let's turn the, all the lights out tonight and do something fun, you know, or do something outside or uh, something like that. So, you know, there are ways to make this stuff uh, fun. I put window treatment management too, you know, like my bedroom at home faces, it gets a lot of Eastern sun. And, um, you know, I close the shades at night, but if I, for, you know, I can forget to put them up during the day, but I mean, there's no reason I would have a, uh, a light bulb on in my bedroom on most sunny days, certainly, but I have to remember to put the shades up. <laughs> so, so, you know, it seems stupid and sort of silly, but it is important, you know, the shades can, can really help in these efforts as well. All right, so that was number two, and that was lights. Number three is thermostats, and I'm not going to spend, I mean, these aren't like, uh, rocket science things, but um, so far. And um, thermostats are really important. And if you have a thermostat that you can't program with a seven day program and different time of day program, you really should get one. It would pay for itself in no time. Um, obviously 
Uh, otherwise, you know, if you have to remember when to set back your heat at night or if you're going away or when you go to work, you know, you're just, it's just not going to work well if you're doing that every day. So at this point, you can get a really good programmable thermostat for less than $100. And you can, for about that amount, get one that's wireless. And if you do forget when you leave your house to set back the heat, you can literally just on an app on your phone set back your heat. So at this point, I would uh, highly recommend that you, uh, that you employ programmable uh, smart thermostats in your house. Um, insulate. So, you know, you're spending a lot of money and you're emitting a lot of carbon by, uh, by having a house that isn't well insulated, if you have a house that isn't well insulated. So it really does make sense to, to make your house better insulated. So the energy that you're putting into the house to cool it or to heat it or to um, ventilate it or whatever is, uh, is as efficient as possible. So again, pretty simple stuff. But, um, but really important. Now, windows cost a lot of money. So windows, new windows, if you have old windows like single pane windows, um, but, they're, but they're in good shape, they're fully functional, you know, it may not make sense for you to replace them with a thermal pane window um, because it'll cost a lot. And although no doubt the, a, a newer efficient window will probably reduce energy related to heating and cooling by 15 to 20%, it still will take you a while to pay that off. So there's, there's other kind of low hanging fruit projects you can do, but, um, but I will say that new windows, absolutely a thermal pane efficient window is gonna reduce your energy consumption and, and your costs associated with heating and cooling. Um, so it's important to do that. Insulating your attic and basement can be another really great way, obviously to, uh, to save money. Um, weather stripping, which is the top right image, uh, simple, inexpensive thing. Weather stripping around windows and doors can really be um, mean, a meaningful way to reduce energy consumption. And then one that maybe you didn't think about as much is um, like you can insulate yourself in your house. I feel like it's a little bit odd that we, you know, we put on clothes when we go outdoors when it's a little colder, a little warmer, you know, accordingly. But inside, like, we want it always to be a certain temperature and I don't know, it doesn't matter what we're wearing. So, um, you know, in the shoulder seasons, especially when, when it's uh, pretty nice outside, um, you know, I just would say to be really sustainable, like you could put on a hoodie in your house and not turn on the heat sometimes. <laughs> so that might sound crazy to some, but if you're really into this, I mean, that would be a very meaningful way to do that. Or, you know, put an extra blanket on your bed so that you can set back your thermostat in the, uh, in the winter time um, at night because every degree that you set it back is going to save you a, a, lot, of, a lot of money. And, and, and more importantly for this presentation, we'll reduce your carbon emissions. Um, okay, number five is to buy Energy Star appliances or highly efficient appliances. Plug load, which is what appliances plug into the wall, right? That's called plug load, is, uh, is about 30% of your electricity too. So about 30% of your electricity is from for lights, about 30% is for things you plug into the wall, and then the remaining uh, third is for uh, basically mechanical related electricity consumption that's running fans in your house or your air conditioning system, things like that. And so, um, Obviously, if 30% of the electricity is from plug load, if you buy more efficient appliances, you're going to really reduce your carbon emissions and energy consumption, and you'll save the money from that reduced utility uh, consumption. So uh, refrigerators, really good thing to focus on because the refrigerator is probably the highest consuming uh, uh, appliance in your house. So, um, so having an efficient refrigerator really makes great sense. And... Um, will reduce your consumption uh, and, and emissions greatly. Window air conditioners, they come in Energy Star. Uh, when you buy one, it gives you an energy uh, rating right on, the, right on the package. And so you can look at that. And uh, you know, the increment that you might pay for a more a highly efficient unit versus one that isn't, I would maintain that you will, through your utility savings, make up that increment. Uh, Quickly, I would say absolutely within two years. So, if, if you're worried about the cost um, element, I mean, you, all of these things save money uh, over time. So, uh, air conditioning obviously important. Uh, TVs, all the screens that you plug in, screen, uh, TVs, computers, phones, important for those to be as efficient as possible. Laundry, um, laundry machines consume 
a ton of energy and a ton of water. Uh, and so having highly efficient Energy Star laundry machines makes really great sense. And everything else, I just put everything. With any appliance that you have, it would be good to just get the most efficient version possible. And it really will take a big bite out of that, uh, out of your energy consumption related to electricity. Uh, unplugging appliances, actually, um, even if they aren't really on, they still are consuming a little bit of electricity. And so if you have an appliance that um, you don't use very much, um, unplug it. It'll save you a little bit of energy as well that way. Um, and another one is, uh, I know a lot of people sort of may have two refrigerators in their house. And again, I would encourage you to really think about, do you need two if you do have two? Um, because the refrigerators use a lot, of, a lot of energy. And you know, I think most people, if they have two, they probably had to replace the refrigerator and then they might've been just like, oh, I'll put the other one in the garage or the other one in the basement maybe or whatever. But the reality is, is you just made a decision that's actually costing you a fair amount of money and that's resulting in a lot of carbon emissions uh, over the course of the year. So, so that's a tip as well. Number six, um, reducing the consumption of hot water. So hot water in your house is um, responsible for a percentage of your carbon footprint. And so to the extent that you can use less hot water, you will reduce the energy associated with that and the emissions associated with that. So this slide just gives some tips for that. Um, so a lot of people think of water, like a lot of people may think, wow, that's water. And yeah, I want to reduce my water, but that's not really an energy thing. But it is. It's obviously an energy thing because the water in your house is being heated by your water heater. And that's uh, presumably either electric. And so it's being fed off the grid or it's a natural gas water heater, which is emitting carbon emissions right out of your house's um, chimney. So here, the tips are pretty simple, taking shorter showers. You know, showers obviously are a big um, consumer of hot water. Uh, putting low flow sinks and showers in. So putting in a shower head that actually uses less water, per, less gallons per minute, uh, obviously saves uh, on not only on water, but also on heating hot heating the water. So that's a good one. Washing clothes in cold water is a great way to reduce uh, your uh, energy associated with hot water. Um, only washing your clothes when you have a full load um, is a great one too. Uh, when it comes time to replace your water heater, um, you know, I think you, it makes perfect sense if you want to have a sustainable house <laughs> to, to get the most efficient uh, system possible. And so one thing I would consider, we've done this on campus, is to consider an instantaneous wa hot water heater. That's a hot water heater in your house. It heats, it does, there's no tank. It's a tankless water heater. And so there's a lot of energy associated with just keeping the water in your water tank hot. But these heaters don't have a water tank, and so they're not, they're, they're not consuming any energy related to that. Um, they're heating water as you need it, and so that's a great way. They do cost more, but definitely uh, will reduce your um, energy associated with hot water. Putting even a simple insulated jacket around your water heater is something that you can ask a plumber to do, or perhaps you can do if you're, if you're good with things like that. Um, and then hands-free faucets, you know, with COVID-19, hands-free faucets, I think, are going to make like a huge uh, it's going to say a comeback, but there, you know, I think people more and more are concerned about obviously not touching things in the bathroom. And so a hands-free faucet, you know, it's only coming on when your hands are underneath it. And, you know, typically that's not thought of as a residential thing. It's more of a commercial thing, but there's no reason that you can't in your house have hands-free faucets. And uh, certainly in your business, uh, it makes perfect sense to have hands-free faucets because in addition to being healthier, you know, you're only using water when you need it when your hands are underneath uh, that. And so like with COVID-19, where we're supposed to sing things twice through and, you know, lather up for 20 seconds, a hands-free faucet can make a big difference. Uh, so, so that's another good uh, tip. Okay, I hope everybody's like staying with me here. Um, we're almost done. And then I really do want to get your questions as well. Um, you know, gasoline, uh, you know, the, the energy, the emissions that, um, that you're responsible for associated with uh, driving are really significant. Typically about 20 to 25 percent of your footprint. Is, it depends, again, on, on, you know, whether you drive and how far you are from work and how much you travel. You know, all those things obviously are variables, but 
for most people, it's about 20 to 25%. And so to the extent that you can drive less uh, or reduce your gasoline consumption associated with driving, that's a great way to be more sustainable, obviously. So uh, this slide uh, gives a number of ways that you can do that, and they're all pretty obvious, but hopefully if wherever you're driving is a distance that you can walk, hopefully you can walk or ride your bike, uh, you can carpool, you know, carpooling immediately cuts emissions in half associated with the people involved in that uh, equation. Um, public transportation, obviously a great way to reduce um, um, your emissions associated with driving your own car. Uh, Zoom meetings like this, you know, you all didn't come to campus, right? We're doing this over Zoom. And so uh, we're all saving a lot of, uh, anybody who would have driven here otherwise, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, consuming that gasoline and emitting those emissions. So that is a way to reduce your emissions associated with that. Uh, mowing your lawn, typically uh, you're using a gas powered mower. And so if you get a real mower or um, um, basically um, if you try to strategically change your lawn a little bit so that you don't have to mow it as often, that's a good way too. Um, and then there's some more kind of things associated with schedules that, you know, strategic kind of sustainable schedules that can reduce your uh, emissions associated with driving. Like if you work five days a week, eight hours a day right now, um, then you're driving to the office five times a week. But if you go to four tens, you're only driving to the office four times a week. That's going to reduce your gasoline consumption too. Um, and, you know, one thing that may come out of the COVID-19 uh, crisis is, um, you know, I think people are getting used to Zooming a little bit more and working from home. And so maybe even after we uh, get through this, uh, maybe that it will be more uh, viable to, maybe you can't do four tens, but you can uh, work from home three or four days a week. And uh, I mean, you know, work from home two or three days a week, whatever it is, but you can work from home a little bit, not have to go into work all the time. So those are some possible tips. Airplane travel, again, it really adds up for people who travel uh, on airplanes quite a bit at, at 0.4 pounds per mile. For the college, airplane travel represents, I think, about 20, uh, 15, I think maybe 15% of our overall emissions or more are from air travel associated with college business. Really adds up. So if you do travel a lot, you know, to be a little more conscious or to be conscious about the fact that air travel does result in carbon emissions is a great thing. If you, if it's possible to fly less, that's obviously a sustainable thing. Uh, but you also can could consider um, offsetting your emissions associated with travel and that uh, air travel. And that's actually a really easy thing to do. Actually offsetting your emissions means that you're investing in a project elsewhere that reduces uh, carbon emissions. And so uh, many airlines, uh, even now, you can, as you're booking your flight, you can ask to offset your emissions and you pay an extra 10 or $15 and, and, they, uh, and your emissions associated with the flight will be offset. So I would encourage you uh, to investigate that because that's a great way to, uh, to be more sustainable as well. Um, I was going to spend a little bit of time on recs and offsets uh, because it is an important thing. You know, the college is achieving neutrality this year, but 75% um, of our emissions are, are being mitigated through offsets or recs. And so uh, you can do that as well. Any, anybody, any business can buy recs or buy offsets. Uh, and again, that's investing in a project elsewhere where emissions are being reduced. RECs uh, are renewable energy credits. They, they um, are used to reduce your emissions associated with uh, electricity consumption only, really. So um, a REC mitigates, if you purchase a REC, a renewable energy credit, you are mitigating 1,000 kWh of electricity. Um, and so you can go online and find different uh, companies where you can buy RECs from a wind farm, perhaps, or a big solar project, or uh, hydro plant, electricity plant, you know, they all have, have these credits and they, uh, you can buy them uh, and in that way reduce your, your emissions uh, as an offset. A carbon offset is a little different. So, uh, so if you think of it, a REC, a renewable energy cre credit, comes from putting carbon neutral energy into the system or onto the grid. So solar power generates electricity, carbon-free electricity, and it goes onto the grid. So it's putting carbon neutral energy into the grid. 
A carbon offset is a project which actually pulls carbon emissions out of the air or prevents carbon emissions from going into the air in the first place. So they are a little different. So a carbon offset, um, an example of that is a tree planting project, which you've probably heard about. You can, you can kind of invest in a tree planting project. Um, because trees pull carbon out of the air, they mitigate carbon in that way. Um, so carbon F offsets, um, again, another great way to, uh, to be more sustainable. We happen to have an alum who, um, whose family uh, has a company called CoolEffect.org. So I wanted to call it out. It's really a great organization. They, it's a place where you can go online and purchase carbon offsets. There's, uh, there's actually a project there. There's a Dickinson project there that alums can go on if they want to invest in uh, an offset and, and uh, contribute it to the college's cause. But you can definitely, as an individual or your business, can go to that site, purchase offsets to reduce your own emissions as well. So that's cooleffect.org. And there's, all, there's, you know, there's other organizations, obviously, out there that you can do this on as well. And it's really, they've made it quite simple to do. And I think the websites are really good in terms of explaining the whole offset um, option. Okay, solar, obviously a great way to be more sustainable. I talked about how Dickinson has, um, has, uh, in, has a lot of solar uh, on campus at this point. Uh, solar has become a much more viable option for your home as well. Um, so solar panels have become way more efficient and, and, um, and have become way less expensive uh, as well. And so they, now, now I would say it's actually quite viable to put solar on your home depending on your solar orientation at your home uh, and things like that. So, um, you know, a lot of that, this is sort of local. There's some different uh, incentives out there, tax incentives and other things. So, um, and it all varies based on where you live, but um, I would encourage you to, to investigate the option of putting solar on your house because the nice thing about it is a lot of these companies allow you to do essentially, essentially like a little mini power purchasing agreement. That's where the PPA is. And the college's solar field that we have is a power purchasing agreement. So basically there's an outside company that owns our panels and we are just buying the solar power, power off of the system um, and paying for it over time. So we didn't pay anything up front for that system um, and we're just paying for it over time with the same money we would have paid for electricity off of the grid anyway. And you can do that at your house. And it's become, it's become um, viable enough economically that this can really work for you. Um, so literally you could have ins solar installed on your house and you would pay for it over time in exactly with, with the same money you would have paid the, the power company. So, um, so it's become really viable uh, like that. So I would strongly encourage um, you to investigate that. If you're replacing your roof, I would encourage you even more to investigate it because uh, you know sort of synchronizing your solar panel installation with your roof replacement is uh, the best way to do that. Oh, and if your roof isn't good, this the picture in this uh, slide does show a, a ground mount solar um, array that you could put in your yard if you have a yard that, that could uh, accommodate that. So it doesn't have to be on your roof. Um, okay, number 10 is to have a more sustainable diet. So Food, um, you know, emissions, overall worldwide emissions are result from food, the production of food and getting it from the farm to the table is, uh, is over 25% of the emissions uh, out there is related to food. So uh, if you want to be more sustainable, I would maintain that this is almost a prerequisite to really try to have a more sustainable diet. Um, and this uh, slide gives you some examples of how you can do that. So one way is to eat less meat. Uh, all meat is actually very carbon intensive to get from the farm to the table. Um, and so plant-based meals are way less carbon intensive. So eating more plants and less meat and especially red meat uh, will uh, result in less carbon emissions. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, uh, an important way to, to be healthier and more sustainable. Obviously eating organic, uh, buying local foods, all really sustainable ways to go. And I would maintain again, um, you know, somewhat of a prerequisite for being, for being sustainable or having a sustainable house or uh, even uh, business would be to consider these things um, and to waste food less. So to kind of right size the food that you're 
that you're putting on the table to what you're actually going to eat so that you don't waste the food is obviously important as well. And this just shows, this slide just shows again that 26% of the emissions are uh, worldwide are from food production. And then I had a 10A and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I ended up at the end of the day having more than 10 things. So I have a few other things, but just Reducing waste, obviously, again, sort of a prerequisite to having a sustainable home or office, you know, need to recycle. Composting is so easy to do for most people. I mean, if you live in the city, perhaps a little bit harder uh, or in an area where you don't have a yard, but, um, but composting your food waste is a great way to reduce the amount of waste you're sending to the landfill and then actually to, to use uh, the compost on, you know, in your own garden or in your yard is a great thing to do. Uh, and then reduce, reduce, recycles. Recycle is obviously part of this. Um, you know, on campus, we eliminated straws last year. So there are no straws on the Dickinson College campus because straws are uh, not a sustainable thing and not really a necessary thing. Um, and then purchasing conscientiously. So purchasing uh, not only locally, but purchasing uh, products that um, come from a business that has uh, a great record in terms of uh, social justice is a great way to be more sustainable. Uh, purchasing things with a high recycled content is a great way to be more sustainable. So those are all good uh, ways to be, to have a sustainable home as well. Your yard uh, is actually a, a responsible, uh, you know, there's a lot of sustainable things that um, are, relate to your yard. This slide goes over those. I'll try to go over this quickly, but basically I would say if you're able to reduce the amount of turf and just sort of grass in your yard, that would make you a more sustainable person. Grass itself is actually a very unsustainable plant. Um, it's, it, in order for grass to be lush, it requires water and fertilizer and constant mowing. Um, so um, none of those things are sustainable. So it makes sense to the extent that it's possible for you to really kind of reimagine, maybe redesign your yard in a way that you can maybe crop out grass areas and have more um, mulched areas and other planting areas so that you don't have to mow fertilizer and water constantly. So, um, so probably that would be the one thing I'd want to call out the most on this list. Obviously trees are incredibly sustainable plants, right? And um, they provide shade for your house so you need less energy in the summertime. They, uh, they mitigate carbon, they pull carbon out of the air. So planting a tree is a great way to be more sustainable. Talked about composting and using that compost in your yard. Uh, the last one there, I think is kind of interesting. If you, cause storm water is a part of your yard too and having rain barrels and trying to use the water that hits your property on your property uh, so that it doesn't go into the storm water system is, is a great way to, uh, to reduce, um, really to protect the waterways uh, in your area. And I think it's really hard to imagine that. You don't think of that when it's raining, but if you take the time to figure out where the water is going that hits your yard, it might make you more motivated to, uh, to do some sustainable things to, to help that watershed. So suggesting maybe, you know, like for us, it's the Chesapeake Bay. You know, the Chesapeake Bay is beautiful. It's a, it supports, all sorts of ecosystems and, you know, it, it makes sense to protect the Chesapeake Bay. And so maybe having a picture of the Chesapeake Bay in my house somewhere would be, would help me remember, wow, I want to, I want to put in more rain barrels or something. Just a tip. And I think we're almost out of time and I, I'm not going to even go over this slide. So why don't we stop there, uh, Andrew, and, um, and I could take questions if there are any out there, but anybody have any questions for Ken, feel free to unmute yourself and feel free to ask them. Ken, it's John Taylor um, here in Virginia, rural Virginia. Two questions for you. First one, uh, Moore's Law and all the rest and all of that in technology, battery technology, um, solar cell technology is changing very quickly and obviously uh, doing a lot with either requires a capital investment, writing a check, whether it's for a home or a business. How, how can one gauge when the right time is to hop in, when the technology is, is, is level or, or makes sense? For, um, 
for a solar project that includes battery storage? Yeah, or yeah, either uh, off-peak electrical use, battery storage. Yeah, um, yeah, most, I think that that's um, an aspect of sort of um, these solar projects that um, is, is becoming much more important, I think. Uh, I know for us, for example, our big, all of our solar projects have no batteries associated with them. So the power is either you directly on campus or it does go to the grid. Um, so, um, but I think uh, increasingly it, it does make sense to investigate um, battery storage versus versus um, doing it in a net metering kind of a way. So, um, you know, I think again, batteries uh, like solar panels are becoming more and more efficient uh, and are, are coming down in price. I don't, I don't have, um, I'm, not, I'm not incredibly experienced with the economics of it, so I would have to look into that and I could, I could try to get back to you on that. But, um, you know, I, I don't think it's quite there yet with batteries, but again, if you do things in, in a PPA kind of a fashion, you know, the, the cost of the battery element would be wrapped into the PPA too. Sure. Economics may be a little less favorable, but, but um, but it's something to, to certainly consider, so. Got it, got it, thanks. Uh, second question, almost along the same lines, uh, where we are here in rural Virginia, they basically have given up on all recycling. They say it's not economical, they have to drive it a long distance, we're up at about 3,000 feet and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Just from a nationwide standpoint and then for rural communities, wh where are, how close are we to being economically reasonable uh, in, in doing uh, recycling for the various household items. Um, you mean in how close are we to kind of having um, options that out there so that you can recycle and, and, and um, I'm not sure, is that what you're I'm saying? Sure. Uh, at what point does it make economic sense? Like I certainly know out here when they've done it, they've said this is an enormous cost to the county. It's not break even. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do, but it's nowhere close to paying for itself. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't, I don't know if I have the answer to that exactly. I will say, um, you know, it's true that um, a lot of the United, the recycling for the United States was actually being sent to China. You know, and that got halted um, not too long ago and so that's thrown uh, a lot of uh, the uh, a lot of constraints on recycling at this point um, obviously so um, and it's sort of unfortunate in some ways because I think the technology is out there now for sort of automated sorting and things like that so it should it was getting easier and easier to just sort of do uh, co-mingled recycling for almost everything landfill waste and you'd only have the two bins and things were sort of going in that direction. Uh, and then, and then uh, things sort of changed there because of the international situation. Um, I, I don't know at what point the economics start, make, start making sense um, truthfully, but I mean, I guess my opinion on it is, is that it's of critical importance. And so people aren't used, you know, this is sort of the problem is people aren't used to paying to do something responsible with their waste. And um, so, you know, God forbid we have to pay $10 a month to recycle, right? But, um, cause we're just not used to it. But I think increasingly it's just gonna be something that becomes much more commonplace and, uh, and it's just gonna be necessary, you know? Um, so I don't know if I have the exact answer to that. I think it's so different for, uh, depending on where you live um, too. Uh, so um, I'm not sure there's one answer for this, which sort of solves it for everybody. But, um, but I think Ken David Bennett with a question, if I may. Yeah. You talk about dimmers uh, being energy efficient. I'm not an electrical engineer, but I do know that a dimmer generates heat. Generation of heat by electricity consumes electricity. And I've always wondered if the energy saved in the light bulb is not being used by the dimmer switch. I think there, there is some energy being used in the dimmer switch, but I think it's relatively minor. And the, the energy that, that reduced wattage of the actual bulb 
outweighs it by quite a bit. So, um, and I do think that, I do think that dimmer switches have also kind of advanced in technology too, so that I think that they are more, more efficient. But I think there is a little bit of energy loss there, but it doesn't outweigh the... Um, I also the, read someplace, Ken, that using battery charges for your cell phones and other devices and leaving them plugged in consumes electricity uselessly. You had mentioned about larger appliances consuming, like the microwave, little light bulb, you know, the, the timer consumes electricity. But so yeah. is my iPhone charger unless I unplug it. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think, yeah, and I think that's something probably a lot of us are, uh, a lot of us do is just plug in our, iPhone, our phones and leave them there even though they're fully charged. Uh, I do think that, I do know some of the newer charging devices, and I think they do this because I also think leaving it plugged in like that isn't necessarily good for the battery. So I'm not sure what their motivation was, but I think that some of the newer devices actually do stop the electricity going into the uh, phone at the point that it's charged. And so that, I think that protects the phone. I think it, it, it protects the life cycle of the battery and I think it reduces energy consumption. So, I mean, those are all good things. So hopefully things are moving in that direction. But by and large, you know, unplugging things that do not need to be plugged in makes great sense. So, um, and you do reduce, like you said, it's the, the light of the, on the clock of your microwave, you know, it's consuming energy. So, um, so it does make sense. It's a little bit inconvenient maybe to do that with everything, but, um, but it will result in reduced energy, reduced emissions, reduced costs. So. Thank you. Yeah. Did we do it? Um, I have a question if you have time. Yeah. And Skelek, I was wondering, did the college investigate um, using wind um, power installations or do you have any knowledge of wind power installations? Yeah, we did. Um, Carlisle itself, uh, where we are, um, is not viable for like a big wind turbine. Um, right here in the valley, right here in Carlisle here. Um, so that's, we've, we've actually investigated that. Um, you know, in order for like a wind turbine to make sense, um, you really, you know, you have to have kind of a continuous wind load of a certain level, like a lot of the time. So it can't just be that it's windy in March, but the rest of the rest of the year, it isn't as windy. And, you know, you have to have this 12, or the viability of wind. And so they can, you know, they know, they know what, what the historical wind sort of patterns are in, in areas, you know, weather stations have that. And anyway, we had that investigated on campus some time ago and it just wasn't there. Uh, we just don't have it for, for campus. So um, now up on like North or South Mountain, which flanks Carlisle, um, Potentially, even at the college farm, um, you know, there there may be a possibility in the future for some, for like a big wind turbine. But right here on main campus, uh, not so much. Now, I will say, the college purchases wrecks from a wind farm, um, so we are we are um, now it's in the Midwest, so um, so that is where we're purchasing our our wrecks from. So that is part of our our climate action planning. So, thank you. Yeah. I think I saw my friend Chris Watts out there. Do you have a question, Chris? So, you might have. No, I don't have a question at this time. <laughs> <laughs> you have questions for me at all? I don't, you know. Um, <laughs> Sorry. One thing, one uh, thing that the group, I saw you there. So. What's that? Yeah. One thing the group might want to know is um, I live in Phoenix. Yeah. So um, we in, last year we installed sunscreens on all our outdoor windows to help keep the sun from shining in. That's reduced our electric costs somewhat in order to use the air conditioner. So that was helpful. That's a great suggestion. We actually did that with our greenhouse here on campus. We put in solar shades. So they're shades that respond automatically to sunlight. Um, mm -hmm. So they'll go up and down depending on heat and sunlight, uh, or you can schedule them time of day. 
um, and it's all automated. And uh, the nice thing is it's solar powered. So there's a little solar power, a little solar panel outside that feeds the mechanism that, uh, that it's automated by. So it, it's not really adding to your electricity consumption, but it's helping in terms of cooling loads mainly. Um, so yeah, you're right. That's a good, that's a good thing to explore. And I really think window treatments in general uh, for both heating and cooling can, can make a difference. And, and it's something you can do that doesn't have to cost a whole lot either. So good point. Okay. Well, I will just say thank you so much for um, tuning in. I hope this was useful or at least somewhat fun. And um, uh, I really appreciate it that you took the time to, uh, to listen in today. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. it was useful and fun. Great. <laughs> thank you. Can yep. you want to stay on for a little bit and catch up? Sure. You do that. Take care, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.